Hello, I'm Dr. Wally Bartfey, and in this lecture, we, we shall examine major emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. Um, we shall first begin by first defining what an infectious or communicable disease is, examine the chain of infection and how we can break it, and also examine some current examples such as avian flu, uh, Zika, Ebola, SARS, and COVID-19. Now, let's begin our learning adventure. Every moment of every day of your life, you are in constant contact with literally billions of microscopic organisms which are found in the air you breathe, in the food you eat, eat, and on nearly every inanimate object you touch during the day, such as doorknobs, elevator buttons, using your phone, computer keyboards, or living persons or animals, including things like family pets and livestock you come into contact with. The human body's normal flora. Well, it is remarkably diverse and complex in nature and consists of more than 200 species of bacteria alone living on our skin. It usually develops in orderly sequence after birth, which results in a relatively stable population of bacteria living on our skin. It is interesting to note that in utero, uh, fetal skin is sterile. However, colonization quickly develops after birth. Here are some quick facts. The human body contains 10 to the 13th power eukaryotic cells in all tissues and organs combined. However, the body routinely harbors about 10 to the 14 uh, power of 10 to the 14 bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract alone. Hence, more bacteria live in and on us than the total number of cells in our entire body. Can bacteria be beneficial? Well, we often think of bacteria as something bad, but in fact, bacteria is critical to our immune system and, and to normal functioning. For example, uh, gram-positive probiotic bacteria, such as lactobacillus acetophilus. There is more than 80 strains of this bacteria alone, and it's present in a lot of over-the-counter uh, probiotic capsules, in yogurt, in uh, Japanese uh, miso soup and tempeh. Uh, they help aid with digest the uh, digestion of lactose, they can uh, be beneficial in treating traveler's diarrhea and irritable bowel syndrome, abbreviated IBS. It can also help combat vaginal infections, and it may also lower a low density lipoprotein, cholesterol levels, and boost your immune system as well. Bacteria, illness, and disease. Well, sometimes bacteria, as we know, can also be harmful, not only beneficial. For example, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, bacteria live harmlessly on your skin as part of your normal flora and also inside your nose. However, when there is a break in your skin barrier resulting from a wound or an open cut, this could quickly lead to contamination and a subsequent localized infection. Here are the three most problematic resistant bacteria that we are currently dealing with on a global scale. Of course, medicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, abbreviated MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococci or VREs, and penicillin resistant Staphylococcus pneumonia as well. In fact, it is estimated that one in nine hospitalized clients in Canada will develop a hospital-acquired infection. There are over 22,000 infections that occur each year in Canada, 
and between 8,000 and 12,000 Canadians die as a result of hospital acquired infections every single year. And the cost to our healthcare system is in excess of $1 billion annually. Here you see a picture on the right that I took of cellulitis of the left leg. These are often uh, acquired in hospital settings. So what are some common causes of antibiotic resistance? Well, first is the incorrect or overprescription of antibiotics. Um, antibiotics are still being routinely uh, prescribed by, by some physicians uh, for, for treating viral infections. And antibiotics are, have uh, no benefit for viral infections, such as the seasonal flu. There is also poor infection control practices which increase the number of harmful bacteria present. And to combat these, it becomes a challenge. Patients not finishing their treatment course for antibiotics. For example, if antibiotics were prescribed for a period of 10 days or two weeks, and the patient uh, feels that they're, they're feeling much better after three or four days and stops taking the antibiotic and does not finish the entire course. This can also re lead to antibiotic resistance. The overuse of antibiotics in livestock and in fish farming industries. So in livestock here, examples are the poultry industry, cattle, and, and, and also for, uh, for pigs and so forth. Uh, poor hygiene and sanitation practices, of course. And lastly, a lack of new antibiotics being researched and developed. Uh, big pharma, big, the big pharmaceutical industries um, rather spend money on developing a, a new uh, pill, for example, a new medication uh, for treat for lowering cholesterol or for treating high blood pressure or for treating depression, uh, which uh, uh, patients have to take for decades as opposed to a course of only a few weeks in comparison to antibiotics. So their, their return on investment is much higher. Hence, uh, investment uh, in terms of the monetary returns on investments in, to develop and research and test new antibiotics. Um, there hasn't been new antibiotics coming down the pipeline as a consequence. Here's an interesting statistic for you. In 2015 alone, Canadians filled over 25 million prescriptions for antibiotics and 1 billion in associated healthcare cost for managing antibiotic resistance. So as you can see, this is certainly a growing public health challenge, not only here in Canada, but also globally. And here's just one example of uh, one disease, tuberculosis. And we know that tuberculosis resistance has been increasing slowly over the decades. And uh, here you see in 2015 stats uh, released from the WHO, the World Health Organization, the Global Tuberculosis Report. Uh, there is over uh, 10.4 million cases, almost 2 million deaths, and roughly half a million uh, uh, TB resistant drug, uh, uh, cases there out, uh, out there as well. So what is an infectious disease? Well, we define an infectious, uh, infectious disease as a communicable disease caused by a specific pathogen, which could be a bacteria, a virus, a fungi, protozoa, or prion, or its toxic products that result through its transmission from an agent to a susceptible host. Okay. And of course, from the public health context, we're always interested in preventing the spread of infectious disease. And here you see one uh, COVID poster that was out in the community, which I snapped, you know, importance of maintaining the two meters apart, six feet or approximately the length of a hockey stick here in Canada. Uh, you know, if you are coughing or sneezing into a tissue or into your elbow, the importance of washing your hands frequently cannot be overemphasized for at least 20 seconds and rubbing it um, to wear a face mask to prevent the spread and correctly fitting on the nose and covering your chin as well uh, to clean up after yourself the clean surfaces that were touched. 
uh, stay home if you're having any symptoms, and of course, to avoid close contact with other individuals. Here's a plague example. Well, there are over 200 species of animals that can carry and transmit plague via infected fleas, including this little cute little chickmunk that I shot a picture of here. So it's a bacterial related infection, Ursaria pestis, and is maintained in nature by wild rodents, such as chickmunks and ground squirrels and prairie dogs, deer mice, voles, and also household pets such as cats and dogs. So what is an infection? An infection is defined as an invasion of the body caused by a pathogen that results in specific signs and symptoms that develop in response to the pathogen, which may be localized or systemic in nature. And some common signs and, and symptoms include redness at the site, there's swelling or edema, if you wish. There is often pain and discomfort in the area. The area is hot to touch or has heat, if you wish. And there is also loss of function to the area. What is a localized infection? Well, a localized infections are limited in scope in nature to a small area. It could be localized, for example, to your eye, such as conjunctivitis, or to a tooth infection, a specific finger, your lips, or specific area of your leg. So here you see, see in a, a, a photo of one for herpes simplex virus sores, or also known as cold sores. So this would be a localized infection limited to the lip area, lip and mouth area. What is a systemic infection? Well, they are significantly broader in scope and widespread throughout the body and are often spread via the circulatory system. Examples include things like hepatitis B, which you can see a picture of the virus here to your right, uh, HIV, uh, which leads to the disease known as AIDS, uh, toxoplasmosis, uh, some systemic fungal infection due to candida as well. So what is a pathogen? Well, a pathogen is this defined as any microorganism. It could be a virus, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, or parasite, um, or other matter such as a, a prion that can cause disease in humans or animals and or result in a morbid process or state uh, to the right here, you see an example of a tapeworm that I took a picture of in a jar. Adult tapeworms can measure more than 25 meters in length or 80 feet, if you wish. And they can survive actually in humans for as much as 30 years uh, in a host. In this table are examples of various types of pathogens in the blue and some examples of diseases that they can cause in humans. So for bacteria, for example, uh, it can cause strep throat, uh, food poisoning, uh, tetanus or lockjaw, uh, pneumonia, syphilis, and various staph-related infections. Viruses, uh, things like the seasonal influenza, uh, COVID-19, SARS, chicken pox and smallpox, uh, HIV AIDS, and hepatitis A and B. Fungi, are things like athlete, athlete's foot, candidas, uh, histoplasmosis, mushroom poisoning, and ringworm. Protozoa, things like malaria, travelers, diarrhea, and so forth. Prions, the Crutchfield Jacob disease, uh, the variant Crutchfield Jacob disease, and things like Kuru. Uh, and various parasites, of course, uh, roundworm and tapeworm and so forth. So let's look at the chain of infection. So the chain of infection really has this sort of six sort of processes. There's a pathogen, a, a required reservoir, a portal of exit, a mode of transmission, a portal of entry, and a new host is in fact infect, infected. Uh, uh, the, the door to a washroom in an air, airline flight, a university campus, a daycare, or a healthcare facility, literally within a matter of hours. 
in our, here's an example related to mold or a fungi in the house. This is very common where there is moisture. And I took this picture in someone's basement. Um, you see the black mold here growing in, 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 in between the insulation in the basement where it was damp and moist. And black mold in a home may be potentially toxic uh, to humans via the production of mycotoxins. They can leave and become airborne. They need to be removed by qualified individuals with the proper masks and so forth uh, because they can damage your internal organs, uh, result in respiratory problems, skin inflammation, nausea, fatigue, and also suppression of your immune system. So it's some, if you have black mold, it is very, very serious and needs to be removed immediately. What is a reservoir? Well, reservoir is defined as a natural environment in which a pathogen typically resides and may be a person, an animal, or the environment. Environment could be things like your soil, right? Um, it may be water, uh, un 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 unpasteurized milk product. Uh, here we see a warning from a medical officer of health for Durham Department of Health here in Ontario. And water is a common reservoir for bacteria. And a warning sign says that the water here in Lake Ontario may be polluted for several days after a heavy rainfall. What is a host? Well, a host refers to an animal and or human on which the pathogen or agent acts to create disease or altered states of health and well-being. A person who is a reservoir for a pathogen, for example, HIV or hepatitis B, uh, may be asymptomatic carrier who can spread the infection to another person. For example, if you, you for unprotected sex, uh, sharing uh, intravenous needles or contaminated uh, dental equipment. The portal of exit is where the pathogenic agents leave their reservoirs and include the circulatory system, the urinary, respiratory, reproductive, and or digestive systems as well. In the case of human reservoirs, the portal of exit may include discharges from the mouth, uh, certain HPVs, uh, saliva for mumps, for example, the nose or throat during a sneeze, uh, sputum for influenza, genitalia and your mucous membranes for the transmission of uh, STI, even uh, sperm in this case, a feces for parasitic infections, and of course, uh, blood and blood products uh, for hepatitis B and things like HIV. So here you see a picture of someone sneezing. So large respiratory droplets containing pathogens like influenza and also COVID-19, for example, can travel two or more meters, six feet, when a person coughs or sneezes. The mode of transmission is the fourth uh, required link in the chain of infection. And it refers to the way the pathogen is passed from a reservoir to a susceptible host, which includes two principal methods. There is a direct method and an indirect method or indirect transmission, if you wish. Three types of direct transmission. Well, direct transmission could occur with contact between body surfaces, for example, touching, shaking hands, uh, sexual intercourse, even kissing. Inhalation of contaminated air droplets, such as influenza or COVID-19 when someone sneezes. And of course, the fecal oral route is also a very, very common cause, especially in developing nations around the world. Here's a uh, picture of a latrine that I snapped in uh, northern uh, Thailand. It can also occur, also we have indirect transmission. Um, it includes travel by non-human or innate objects or materials, such as uh, food items, maybe have contaminated soil, uh, kitchen sponges and towels, uh, clothing, doorknobs, elevator buttons. Uh, indirect transmission of a pathogen or infectious agent may also occur via vectors such as insects, birds, or other animals. 
And here you see a picture of a mosquito. And in fact, the mosquito is the most deadly animal in the world. It is not the great white shark or a poisonous cobra. It is in fact the mosquito because the mosquito kills over 1 million people every single year for a host of different diseases. Here's another example involving bed bugs. Um, and you see a picture here of a foot that I took of bed uh, bug bites on the foot and ankle region. Um, they're readily transmitted. Bed bugs are readily transmitted uh, in, in people's luggage, in their clothing, bedding and furniture. Uh, and they have a, undergone a dramatic resurgence uh, worldwide. According to a recent laboratory-based study, bed, bike, bed bugs may just be as dangerous as its sinister cousin, the kissing bug, uh, which can transmit the parasite that causes uh, uh, Chagas disease. What is the portal of entry? Well, the portal of entry is the fifth link in the chain of infection, uh, where pathogenic agents enter the body of a susceptible host. For severe infections, the portal of entry are within the same system as the portal of exit. However, cross-contamination can also occur. So it could be the skin, for example. It could be via the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, the urogenital tract, and of course also the placenta for women. Here's an interesting example in your home example. What's growing on your kitchen sponge well one study which examined uh, bacteria present on uh, kitchen sponges uh, found the presence of over 362 different species of bacteria growing on these kitchen sponges and that one square uh, centimeter of sponge could contain up to 45 billion bacteria and what we can do, encourage people to do from a public health lens, is simply to prevent potential uh, infections with bacteria and, and other agents as well. We can microwave it for one minute, and it's, and it's found that if we microwave a wet sponge for a minute on high, it kills about 99.99% of bacteria uh, present. Uh, but we should also change kitchen sponges quite regularly as well. What is the immune system? Well, the immune system is defined as a complex system that is responsible for distinguishing a host from everything foreign and for protecting the body against a host of infectious agents and also foreign substances. The immune system also has two type of responses for an invading pathogen. It could be natural or innate or acquired or adaptive in nature. So here's an interesting fact. Most of your immune system is actually in your gut. It is estimated that approximately 70 to 80% of your total immune system responses reside in, in, in your intestinal tract or your gut, right? So we have various things like immunoglobulin A, bearing cells, um, and, and also GALT cells. What is immunological competence? Well, it's defined as the body's ability to defend itself against pathogens and includes factors such as one's age, hereditary, temperature, uh, one's nutritional status, the presence of other diseases or comorbidities such as diabetes, age, uh, AIDS, Cooley's anemia, and environmental factors. Without a normal immune system, which employs both cell cellular and hormonal elements, we would quickly fall victim to serious life-threatening infections and or malignancies as well. What is an inflammatory response? Well, that occurs when the body is injured or infected, resulting in the release of a product called histamine and other substances that cause blood vessels to dilate and fluid to flow out of capillaries into the surrounding tissues. This results in the localized heat, swelling, and redness associated with, infectious, uh, with infections. What are emerging infectious diseases, abbreviated EIDs? Well, the World Health Organization defines 
and emerging infectious disease as one that has appeared in a population for the first time or that may have existed previously, but is rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range. A particular feature of many EIDs is their capacity to spread internationally due to travel, trade, and or migration of species. These include things like birds, migratory birds and insects, and consequently impact health from a global perspective. Here's some recent examples of an EID. They include things like Lyme disease, Zika, Ebola, West Nile, SARS, uh, avian influenza, uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and of course COVID-19. In this picture to the right, the photo here, you see a photo of a hand that I took, and you see that bull's eyes rash uh, associated with uh, Lyme disease uh, following a tick bite in, in these areas. There's also very critical to point out the zoonotic connection. Um, we know that approximately 75% of all emerging and re-emerging infectious, infectious diseases are in fact zoonotic in nature, meaning they have an, an animal sort of origin besides humans in nature that has gone into the human species as well. So human immunodeficiency virus types 1 and 2, in other words HIV-1 and HIV-2, various uh, etiological agents of age, uh, AIDS that cause about one to two million annual deaths every year, uh, have been linked to cross-species transmission of Simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, uh, from chimpanzees. There's a lot of zoonotic drivers here. Uh, it could be things like modernization of agricultural practices. Instead of having small family farms, we now have these large scale, single animal farm factories occurring. Habitat uh, destruction, including clear cutting of rainforest and open pit mining. And of course, human encroachment, uh, growing population, increasing global trade and travel, and of course, uh, climate change. Here's an interesting photo I took of uh, Saibuyu Crossing in Tokyo, Japan. It is the world's busiest intersection uh, with an estimated 3,000 people crossing per traffic light change. And I happened to take this photo. It was on a late Sunday afternoon and you can just see how crowded it was on a late su Sunday afternoon. Uh, just imagine on Monday morning during rush hour how busy it is. Uh, so there could be lots of cross-contamination here with people laughing and coughing and so forth and bumping into each other uh, happening in such dense, densely populated areas. How do infectious diseases emerge or re-emerge? Well, there are two basic ways. First, by changes in their geographical re ranges and regions and also by something that we call adaptive emergence that results from a genetic change in the microorganism that makes, the, makes it the microorganism potentially capable of jumping to a new host species, which may include humans. Um, so classical examples there are things like poultry, right? So avian flu, um, which has jumped into human species Mosquito-borne disease example, well, we know that climate change, as noted before, can also directly affect disease transmission of mosquito-borne diseases by shifting the vector's geographic range and increasing reproductive and biting rates and by shortening the pathogen's required incubation period. So things like malaria, and Zika and Dengue, and of course, West Nile virus as well. Here's an example related to West Nile virus. First, of course, it appeared in Africa and over time is slowly spread into Europe and because of international trade and travel and also global warming, it was able to go into North America and spread into countries, cold countries, in fact, like Canada. 
So West Nile virus, of course, first was detected in Uganda, Africa in 1937. Uh, by the 1990s, there were more virulent strains emerged in North Africa. Hence, we had the outbreaks in Europe, in the Middle East, like Romania, Russia, and Israel as well. Uh, 1999, the virus was first detected in North America, in New York City. In 2001, it was first detected in birds and mosquitoes in the province of Ontario, Canada. And we had our first case in 2002. And of course, by 2003, we also had cases occurring in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. This is another classical example, is the avian influenza example, also referred to as bird flu or avian flu. It is a very highly contagious viral infection that can affect severe species of food producing birds, uh, including things like chickens and turkeys and quails and, and guinea fowl, as well as pet birds and wild birds as well. There are two major types, the low pathogenic avian influenza and the high pathogenic avian influenza forms. The H5N1 uh, was an example of one that occurred in Hong Kong. This is a, 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 a this, this type of avian influenza A virus. It occurred in 1997 in Hong Kong, and it consisted first of 18 confirmed cases and six associated deaths. Uh, subsequently, it, uh, it killed uh, nearly 60% of all clients who became infected with this strain of bird flu. The outbreak was finally halted by a territory-wide slaughter in Hong Kong of more than 1.5 million kitchens by the end of December in 1997. So here's a picture of some chickens in a West Market in Asia I took. In, in these wet markets in, uh, in Asia, you'll often see a mixing of many types of animals, uh, chickens and uh, pigs and, and snakes and, and various types of seafood and so forth, all located within the same market. So cross-contamination of species is, is, is these, these sorts of wet markets are really breeding grounds for it. And we know what happened in Wuhan, China with COVID-19 as well where the, the COVID-19 outbreak was linked back to a wet market there as well. Another example is the Ebola virus uh, disease, or EVD for short. It's also clinically known as Ebola hemorrhagic fever. It's a relatively uh, rare, yet potentially deadly viral disease that can affect both humans and primates uh, alike. So monkeys, gorillas, and chimpanzees. It was first recognized in 1976 uh, in Africa. And during the 1976 outbreak, for example, there were 284 cases and 150 deaths were reported in Sudan. The case fatality rate is very, very high at 55%. Some of the classical symptoms include things like fever, aches and pains, uh, severe headache, muscle and joint pain, abdominal pain, uh, there is weakness and fatigue, various gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, diarrhea, uh, vomiting, abdominal pain, unexpected hemorrhaging, bleeding or bruising uh, also. Another one that we see here in North America and also in Europe is Lyme disease. It's a multi-system infection. It's manifested by progressive stages and is caused by a spirocyte. Uh, basically this uh, pathogen transmitted by uh, black-legged deer ticks. And Lyme disease is in fact the most commonly reported vector-borne disease in North America currently. Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS for short, is defined as a potentially life-threatening coronavirus, or sars v infection, that infects the respiratory system with an average incubation period of six days and which is spread by close person-to-person -person contact by infected individuals, most often via droplets, droplets expelled into the air during coughing or sneezing episodes. It could also be expelled during exercise and singing. Here you see some uh, individuals, I snapped this picture, in, a, in a new territories in Hong Kong, people practicing uh, Tai Chi. 
And of course, these droplets could be spread into the air like there as well. SARS was first identified in 2003 and is believed to be derived from an animal reservoir reported to be horseshoe bats uh, located in uh, southern China, uh, which was tracked and isolated to remote damp cave located in the Yunnan province, specifically of China. And of course, other coronavirus-based diseases include MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which have been tracked back to camels, and COVID-19, which is of course believed to be of zoonotic origins uh, as well. Here's a picture of some resting bats that I took uh, when I was in uh, Australia in uh, resting in Here's a tree. suggested additional reading. It's uh, chapter 13, uh, Major Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Diseases, uh, written from a Canadian perspective. Well, that's all, folks. I hope you enjoyed this lecture related to infectious diseases, and I hope that you listen to others in this mini lecture series related to the art and science of public health. Cheers. Cheers.